for the kind invitation and the very nice introduction. It's a great pleasure to be here. So uh, today I, I will talk about the Euler characteristic, which is a very important um, equation or formula, not on the curtain, unfortunately, but uh, I like it very much. So I thought I would talk about this equation and um, how from topology, we can actually start uh, understanding data through topological data analysis. So in particular, uh, the plan of the talk today is, uh, is very ambitious. So I want to cover many topics, but uh, uh, it will not be in very much detail. I will start with my favorite equation, the Euler characteristic, and then I will explain how we can uh, construct topological invariance for simplicial complexes, for example, the other characteristics. Uh, then I will turn on to spaces coming from data, uh, which is uh, going to the topic of topological data analysis and uh, describe a construction of simplicial complexes for data. Towards the end, I will uh, tell you a little bit about applications to neuroscience of topological data analysis and also the other characteristic actually, and uh, some applications to machine learning we are uh, recently developing with the TDA group at KTH, where Wojtek is part of Francesca and, uh, and many others. Okay, so let's start uh, with uh, Euler, a uh, very, very important mathematician, uh, Swiss mathematician, physicist, astronomer, geographer, logician, engineer. Uh, I could talk a lot about him. Uh, he's maybe the most famous mathematician of the 18th century. And uh, he did very, very important work, foundational work in many fields. So ranging from analysis to graph theory, uh, number theory, uh, and this is more like a fun fact. He also introduced many notations we use every day. I didn't know they came from Euler. So for example, the notation f of x, when you apply a function f to x, was introduced by him. Or also a, a notation for trigonometric functions, i to uh, tell us a, a right about imaginary numbers, e as a basis for natural logarithms, all this very basic notations we use every day, they were introduced by uh, Leonard Euler. And uh, just to name a few quotes about him by very famous and important mathematicians. So apparently Laplace said, read Euler, read Euler, he's the master of all of us. And uh, Gauss uh, said, the study of Euler's work will remain the best school for different fields of mathematics uh, and nothing else can replace it. So huge personality, mathematical personality in the 18th century with um, very many uh, contributions. One of his contributions is the Euler formula or the Euler polyhedra formula. So here uh, you can see it as uh, depicted on a, a stamp, a German stamp uh, commemorating uh, the anniversary of his death. And, and the formula says as follows. So if you have a convex polyhedra, which is, it's a geometric object that you can think about as gluing together different polygons along edges. Um, if you denote by V, the number of uh, um, vertices, E, the number of edges, F, the number of faces, and you take the alternating sum, then this is two for every convex polyhedra. So here I drew one, it's a cube. Uh, how many vertices do we have? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight vertices. How many edges? Well, there are 12 edges. How many faces? There are six. And we can notice that 8 minus 12 plus 6 is equal to 2. So this is a uh, Euler formula. And um, it's an alternating sum of counts of geometric objects. Uh, in general, uh, you can see from this table I, I just took from Wikipedia that uh, if we have a tetrahedron, then the number of vertices is four, edges is six, faces is four, alternating sum, we get two. 
the cube, we already did it. Octahedron, we already, uh, six, 12, eight, and we get two. Then we have dodecahedron, iso, iso, icosahedron, and, and so on. All of this alternating sum uh, of uh, numbers of geometric objects sum up to two. And um, this formula is, is quite interesting and uh, can be generalized, for example, to surfaces or graphs. But uh, the extension or generalization I would like to talk about is to simplicial complexes, actually. So uh, what are simplicial complexes? We can see them uh, geometrically as geometric objects built by building blocks, these building blocks being simplices. We have zero simplices, which we can see as uh, vertices, one simplices, which are edges, two simplices, which are full triangles, three simplices, tetrahedron, and so on. And this is considered to be full. So they are building blocks of geometric objects, and then we want to put them together informally to build objects like this one, which are built by gluing simplices uh, along phases and uh, with the property that a subset of elements in this set are still elements of this set. So for example, if I have this full triangle in the simplicial complex and I take the edge, then the edge must also be an element of the simplicial complex. If I take this edge here and I take the two vertices, which build it up, the two vertices are also part of this uh, simplicial complexes. Uh, also, when I glue these objects together, um, they cannot be glued along like half phases. I cannot build something like this. They have to be glued a along a common phase. This is not allowed. So this in is in fact the geometric realization of uh, uh, abstract definition of simplicial complex, which is uh, uh, quite straightforward to state. So to do this, we have to fix a set U, which is the universe of all our elements. And then uh, we call the simplicial complex a collection of um, subset of this universe, uh, such that it is closed under inclusion. So if um, K is in K, so if you have an element, a simplex in K, then any non-empty subset of K is also in K. So this is the property of simplicial complexes. And to go back to the geometric interpretation, we have that x0, xn is an n simplex because it can be visualized in a geometric space as an object of dimension n. So this is one plus the number of elements, uh, one minus the number of elements that you have in the set. Okay, so for uh, simplicial complexes, uh, the Euler characteristic uh, is as follows. Uh, we take uh, k0, k1, k2, which is the number of zero simplices, one simplices, two simplices, and so on. So ki is the number of i simplices in the simplicial complex and take its alternating sum. This is the uh, Euler characteristic uh, for a simplicial complex. And uh, here is, is just an example. So here uh, I drew two very simple simplicial complexes. Uh, we have uh, this uh, square here. This is an empty square. I just have the boundary <clears throat> of the square. There's nothing inside it. And uh, as you can see, this has four vertices, one, two, three, four, and uh, four edges, one, two, three, four. Uh, no two-dimensional faces. Uh, so the Euler characteristic is just four minus four, which is equal to zero. Now uh, let's turn to this other example down here, where I just added a triangle, a full triangle on top of the square. Uh, how many vertices do we have here? We have one, two, three, four, five vertices. How many edges? One, two, three, four, five, six. And then one two-dimensional phase. So here again, the Euler characteristic is zero. This is not uh, a coincidence. Actually, uh, we were expecting the Euler characteristic to be the same between these two simplicial complexes uh, because the Euler characteristic is a topological invariant. And, to, and these two objects are topologically equivalent. Uh, one can continuously deform this one here to obtain the one above. You just flatten the, the roof of the house. 
So topology is about uh, co um, modifying objects without breaking them and uh, continuous deformations and Euler characteristic is a first example of topological invariant. Okay, uh, the Euler characteristic can also uh, be expressed in terms of uh, Betty numbers. Uh, but to do that, I have to introduce what homology is. Homology is another topological invariant, which is very important for simplicial complexes. And it tells us about the connectivity of these simplicial complexes. So I will now briefly introduce um, homology and, uh, and write the Euler characteristic in topological terms, uh, the full Euler characteristic. So um, consider a simplicial complex, and then we have to take the set of its simplices of various dimensions. So uh, as before, we have uh, y0, which are vertices, y1, which are edges, y2, which are faces, and so on. Fixed, uh, a vec um, fixed a field f, we can consider vector spaces generated by these sets and the sequence uh, of linear maps between them. These are given by boundary operators. Now, I don't have the time to explain this in detail, but uh, the idea is that we go from higher dimensional simplices to lower dimensional simplices by taking their boundary. So if, for example, I have this simplex here, I first have to put an order on the set of vertices, A, B. Maybe I say that A is a smaller than B. And then the boundary of A, B will be B minus A. I look at its boundary. So it's B, this vertex here, minus this vertex here. And this formula is defined by, by the orientation. So I first take away the first element and then I obtain B. And then I take away the second element and obtain A. And then I consider alternating sum of these moves. This is um, more or less how the boundary operators are defined. And, uh, and the idea, is that uh, we want to use these boundary operators to go from higher dimensional simplices to lower dimensional simplices. So with my example here on the left, if I want to build this uh, sequence of uh, linear maps and vector spaces, then it would look like this. Uh, how many vertices do I have? I have three vertices. So I can write F3 because I have three copies of my field. How many edges? Two. F2. How many two dimensional faces? One. And then I don't have higher dimensional simplices, higher dimensional building blocks. And then here, I will have matrices representing these boundary operators. And the matrices, uh, I, I can put an order A, B, C. And I say that A is a smaller than B, and B is a smaller than C and A is a smaller than C. So then when I want to compute this boundary operator, offline so that uh, it's, it's a bit quicker at this point, but uh, um, if I have AB, the edge AB, then its boundary would be B minus A. Then I have BC and its boundary would be C minus B. And then AC and its boundary would be C minus A. And here instead, I have the two dimensional cell, two dimensional simplex ABC. And its boundary can be written as BC minus AC plus CA plus AB. Sorry. Okay, so this is the chain complex for this very easy example here, where I have vector spaces and linear maps between them. So I have matrices actually, it's a very concrete thing. And then uh, one can check that uh, if I compose two of these boundary maps, then the composition is zero, which means I can consider this quotient, the kernel of a map divided by the image of the other. And this is what the homology is. This is the homology vector space. So um, the dimension of the homology is sometimes called Betty numbers. 
And these are our invariants we really care about, and then we can count from simply shell complexes. Uh, if you look at this example here, we had that matrix uh, delta one, and uh, just by doing a little bit of elimination, you can see that um, the rank of this matrix is two, the kernel has dimension one. So in particular, the H zero, which is F divided by the image of Delta one. This is of dimension one. And the H one, which is F, which is the kernel of Delta one divided by the image of Delta two, this is zero. Because the kernel of delta one is one dimensional, the image of delta two is one dimensional, so their quotient is, is zero dimensional. So what, what can I say about this object here? It has H zero of dimension one and H one of dimension zero. Intuitively, what H zero tells us about is connected components. In fact, that triangle I had before, we would say it has just one connected component. H one tells us about cycles. I could not see cycles in the object I, I drew before. There was a cycle, but it was also a boundary of a two dimensional cell. Here in this torus, intuitively, we have one connected component because we can just see one component in the object. And then we have two cycles representatives, one being this one and one being this other one. And they are independent. And then I also see that I have H2, which is isomorphic to K or, or to F, sorry, with my notation before, because there is a void within the torus. So intuitively, homology is this topological invariant, which tells you about connected components, cycles, and voids in topological objects, as for example, simply shell complexes. And um, one important result is that uh, the Euler characteristic can be written as alternating sum of the dimension of the simplices or alternating sum of the Betty numbers. So in particular, these two quantities are the same. Let's say that uh, computing homology is a simplification. We have many more simplices which are not accounted. Uh, when when you do uh, homology, but but in the end, by doing this alternating sum, we actually get the, the same number. So here, you remember the Euler characteristic was uh, uh, was zero. Uh, we can just um, quickly go through uh, the homology of this object. How many connected components does it have? It has one connected component. It's a connected object, so we can say that in this case, beta zero is equal to one. Uh, but also beta one is equal to one because we can see that there is this cycle here, which is not a boundary. And there are no two dimensional cavities because there are actually no two dimensional surfaces to enclose these cavities. So we have that here, the other characteristic as already we knew before by the simplex count is one minus one, which is equal to zero. And also here, um, one connected component, one cycle, and that's it. And these objects are uh, equivalent topologically, so they also have to have the same uh, Betty numbers. Yeah, so when you do uh, cell complexes, rather than simplicial complexes, it's rather cheaper because you need many more simplices to triangulate an object rather than uh, when you consider cell complexes. And uh, the, the examples I had earlier of the Euler characteristic, uh, they were all uh, homotopic to the sphere. So that would be the, the Euler characteristic of the sphere. This uh, polyhedra, convex polyhedra I had in the beginning, they, they are all the Euler corresponding to the Euler characteristic of, of the sphere, actually. Okay. Uh, so now it's a good time to, to move. Uh, from uh, algebraic topology and uh, standard methods, uh, classical methods in topology uh, to the topology of data. Uh, 
um, what, what are the desired properties when we look at uh, topological invariants for data? Well, they should be informative about the data. They should be computable because we want to use it in a real world data set. And then they should somehow be able to take into account noise. So they should be stable with respect to perturbations of the data. These are properties that as mathematicians, we want to keep in mind. Uh, why do we use topology uh, to do data analysis? Uh, well, first of all, because studies connectivity, as we saw in the first part of, of the talk. Uh, so we can um, uncover clustering, for example, with H0 or cyclic behavior with H1 from the data. And um, it can reveal the shape of data or geometric insight from, uh, from the data. And uh, it can somehow, uh, in some case, in some particular cases, uh, determine dimensionality reduction of, of, of the data set. And furthermore, uh, we see it as a natural step beyond network theory, which is very much used uh, to understand complex data. Uh, so how do we uh, obtain these simplicial complexes starting from data? Uh, one construction is uh, the autoris rips complex. So we can start with a point cloud, a set of points in high dimensional Euclidean space, uh, a set of points as depicted here, and associate to each point uh, a ball centered in the point of radius epsilon. So we are fixing the epsilon. Then we can look at pairwise intersection of, of these balls and, and construct a simplicial complex from here. So we say that uh, a set x0, xn of n plus one elements forms an n simplex if the ball uh, centered at the points are pairwise intersecting. So we take each pair of points, balls of radius epsilon, and check for uh, intersection between them. This is a definition uh, which has uh, somehow a uh, geometrical uh, understanding, but in general, given a metric space XD uh, or also a pseudometric space or a distance space, actually, we can construct the Torres rips at scale, scale epsilon as the set of elements uh, X0, Xn, um, such that pairwise distances are smaller or equal than epsilon. So in particular, uh, this is a so-called flag complex because we just look at pairs of elements in, in our metric space or, or data set to construct this implicial complex. Uh, sometimes, uh, actually, we, we don't have uh, uh, data in the form of a metric space. Uh, we have, uh, or, uh, yeah, or points in Euclidean space. Uh, our data set looks like a direct graph. And this is about the application I will tell you about. So uh, to this data, uh, the, the idea is to associate uh, an oriented simplicial complex by isolating what we call directed clicks. So uh, what are uh, directed clicks? They are all to all uh, connected elements in the graph, uh, but which have an intrinsic directionality. So there is a source and, and a sink in the click. Here, for example, you can see uh, one, two, three are oriented from one to three. One is a source because all edges are outgoing from one and three is a sink because all edges are incoming to three. Same here for these other types of orientation between these three vertices. Uh, here, one, two, three instead have a cyclic orientation. So this is not so-called directed click. So if we have a, a directed graph with set of vertices B and set of edges E, then uh, the abstract oriented simplicial complex uh, can be thought of as uh, these sets of n plus one vertices such that Vi, Vj is a directed edge for each i smaller than j. So you see this is a directed click complex and it's an oriented simplicial complex because uh, we have a, a notion of orientation in the definition which captures a notion of orientation that we have in the input data, so the, the graph. In this case, uh, we see here this very small example of graph. The top part 
will be a two simplex. So four to one will be a two simplex because it is oriented from four to one, while four to three is a cycle. It's not a two simplex. So it's not a simplex in the simplicial complex. This is the type of objects we have been using uh, to uh, study um, uh, reconstructions of uh, microcircuits of the somatosensory cortex as built by the Brooklyn project. And uh, here is a reference to uh, the cell paper where they describe actually how this data was constructed. Uh, just in a few uh, high level words, uh, the idea is uh, to define uh, morphological types of cells. Uh, they had 55 uh, morphologies, detailed morphologies, and then place them um, in a, in a micro column they call, so an area in space, three-dimensional space. And, and then they have a quite sophisticated algorithm uh, to define a connectivity uh, between uh, these, uh, these neurons and understand what is the directed graph uh, which supports uh, activity in, in this microcircuit of the somatosensory cortex. Uh, the goal is to uh, study emergent behavior of the microcircuits through simulated neural activity and understand this uh, very important question, how uh, structure influences function. Here, here is a very beautiful uh, picture of the microcircuitry uh, from, from the Blue Brain Group, from Henry Markram's group. Uh, so uh, the first thing we did on, on this data set, which uh, uh, we received as uh, directed graphs was to look for these directed simplices. And uh, we actually understood that these were motifs of the data. So they were more abundant than in randomizations of the data set. Uh, so in blue, you can see this data uh, about the somatosensory cortex, the reconstruction of the somatosensory cortex, structural reconstruction. And in green, for example, it's an erdos rainy random graph with the same number of neurons, 31,000, and the same connection probability, 0.8%. And here in between are various randomizations of the original circuit, which take into account some of the biological rules that were used to create the original circuit, but not all of them. So some steps in the generation of the microcircuits were um, actually uh, change to uh, easier uh, randomizations, random uh, steps. And, and you can see that we have uh, more simplices in the original data, and they are actually uh, quite high dimensional, getting up to dimension seven. This was very much unexpected, actually. And uh, it also correlates uh, to uh, activation with respect to stimuli in, in the microcircuits. Uh, in fact, uh, we can see that um, neurons, which, um, which are towards the end of these high dimensional simplices, have more correlated activity. Um, as was uh, actually understood at the time, and as Arvind reminded me <laughs> lately, this is because of uh, these neurons uh, have a lot of shared inputs. So these motifs actually capture this information, which is important for the functionality of the network. Having a lot of uh, shared input is important for having correlated activity. Uh, but uh, here again uh, comes uh, our uh, Euler characteristic and um, just a small exercise to, to recap um, uh, the Euler characteristic. So you can see here this uh, double pyramid, which is uh, empty inside. Uh, now, uh, this is a simplicial complex coming from this uh, notion of uh, directed simplices. Uh, can, can you remember, can you figure out what is the Euler characteristic of this example here?
Okay, but uh, it is two. Uh, so one can uh, look at uh, simplest counts uh, as before. So we have uh, six simplest zero dimensional simplices, one, two, three, four, five, six, 12 edges, eight uh, two dimensional simplices, which are the walls of this double pyramid. And we get two, or otherwise we can look at petty numbers. So one connected component, no one dimensional cycles, but one void inside this double pyramid. So here the Euler characteristic is two. This is just to say that this notion of Euler characteristic is also well defined in this case of oriented simplicial complexes. And we actually computed it in the blue brain data. And it was quite informative uh, because um, if we take data from uh, five different rats, so biological data from five different individuals and reconstruct the microcircuits based on this biological information, we could see a quite different differentiation pattern between the Euler characteristic from this, these different uh, biological informations against the highest Betty number. So B5 was the highest Betty numbers we have in these microcircuits. Uh, I don't have a clear interpretation for this, but it was uh, interesting to see how this Euler characteristic, which is completely un unrelated to, to neuroscience or neuroscience data was actually able uh, to uh, characterize this biological information coming from five different uh, individual rats. We were also interested in understanding uh, how uh, signal in, is, uh, is transmitted and how uh, this relates to this uh, structural information we have on the graph. And for this reason, uh, we have built uh, successful transmission graphs. And um, the idea is to uh, consider the fixed stimulus and uh, fixed a time interval, which is here five milliseconds, and um, record successful transmission within this five um, milliseconds. So we have a sequence of graphs all having the same vertex set, but it, there is an edge at time t if one vertex uh, fires and then within five milliseconds, the other neuron fires and they are structurally connected. If they are structurally connected, but there is not <coughs> this uh, correlation of information, uh, then they will, uh, we will not have an edge in the sequence of, of graphs. With these successful transmission graphs, uh, we were actually able to characterize the activity in terms of uh, Betty numbers. So here is the Betty 1 and Betty 3. And we can see this stereotypical pattern of uh, creation of uh, more and more complicated uh, topological structures in the microcircuit as the stimuli was, was evolving in, in the microcircuit. Okay, so um, up to now, I've been describing a sort of global uh, discrete invariants for these data sets, uh, which are simplex counts, Betty numbers, Euler characteristics. Uh, one thing we are actually interested in data analysis is uh, looking at uh, continuous versions of them, uh, invariants that are stable under perturbations of the data set and are not just count of patterns. Uh, so this is why I would like to uh, briefly introduce uh, this notion of persistent homology and stable rank that actually captures uh, this evolution of uh, discrete uh, invariants at various uh, scales of the parameter. So here uh, we have our point cloud we had in the beginning, and we look at these Vittori strips complexes at, at various scales. And we can compute the homology of each one of these simplicial complexes and track how homology changes in this sequence uh, through a so-called barcode. This object is, is well defined mathematically and it's also uh, an invariant of this sequence of simplicial complexes and, and homology. This is just a visual uh, representation of it. And actually barcodes are very much used in topological data analysis because they are stable with respect to perturbations of the input data. One problem uh, with barcodes is that um, it's very hard to do statistics with them and, and machine learning with them. Uh, so this is why uh, with uh, Wojtek, 
and uh, the TDA group, uh, we have been uh, developing a, a different uh, descriptor, which can also be interpreted as a functional um, summary of the barcode, but it can also be generalized to a situation in which the barcode is not defined. And, and this is called a uh, stable rank. With stable rank, uh, we obtain a piecewise constant function and uh, which describes um, how uh, a topological property of a given data set compares to topological properties of other data sets in a metric neighborhood. I, I will not go into the, the detail of the definition because it's quite uh, uh, abstract. I, I don't have the time to do that. But um, uh, the idea is that uh, this is informative because we obtain persi persistent features after a simplification. So this is a simplification process where we uh, eliminate noise at various scales. Uh, it's computable. Uh, in, in the one dimensional case, uh, there is implementations by Wojtek, which are um, also based on uh, Ripser software by Uli Bauer, which is a state of the art for Vietorius Rips filtrations. And we also have something for uh, more complicated uh, data sets like multi-parameter persistence. And it is one Lipschitz with respect to um, the metric used to uh, compare data sets. So this is what I mean by stability. We want continuous functions from the space of data sets to the space of our descriptors. Um, how, how can we compute it? Uh, well, for example, uh, as I said, we have the stable ranks looks as these functions, something looks like this. There are non-increasing functions. And uh, if we use a metric, which we call the standard metric, uh, this is just uh, uh, at step T, number of bars in the barcode decomposition of length at least T. So it's like a histogram of the length of bars in the barcode decomposition. And the computational complexity is cubic in the number of simplices. So this, this is invariant we can uh, easily uh, compute on uh, this sized data set. Uh, but uh, the, the key property of this environment is not only that it is stable, but it depends on the metric we use to compare data sets. This is actually quite important. Uh, as a motivating example, I have here some um, reconstructions, uh, images of, of neurons. And if we run the standard pipeline with this standard distance, then uh, short branches in the neuron would be considered just as noise in the data. Uh, but we see here, with these cells that actually uh, short branches on the top or the bottom are important for the identification of a class of neurons, for example, the stuffed cells. So in, in some situations, which also come from uh, neuroscience data, we actually want to tune the metric to have um, a better understanding of our data set, or if not to tune, at least to be able uh, to have a wide variety uh, of metrics to compare data sets. So this is why uh, uh, contours came into play. Uh, the idea is to have a rich family uh, of metrics uh, parameterized by functions. Uh, this notion of contours uh, came uh, first in a Wojtek by, uh, first in an article by Wojtek, Kawulski and Oliver Gaffert, and then they were explored uh, further in a paper uh, by Wojtek and Henry Rihimatki. And, um, the notion of contour is a function uh, from zero infinity times zero infinity to zero infinity, which satisfies these conditions. So if I apply to A and zero, it has to be A. If I apply it first to A and epsilon, then tau, it has to be the same as A and then epsilon plus tau. And then uh, it preserves order on the first and the second coordinate. So it is actually an action of zero infinity on zero infinity. Contours are uh, many, and uh, they are, uh, for example, uh, uh, parameterized by functions with uh, positive values. Um, one way to obtain a contour is uh, through these densities. So given any function f, uh, we can build a, a contour in this way. We say that the value of the contour associated to f at a and epsilon is how much I have to move under the curve, so how much I have to integrate from A to obtain an area of epsilon. 
this is a way to construct uh, a matrix, so a contour, uh, starting from, from densities. And uh, with all these possibilities of changing contours and changing uh, metrics to understand our data set, uh, comes the need of understanding uh, when a metric is good or not, assessing the power of a metric in a discrimination task, for example. Um, so here uh, uh, we can define uh, a kernel uh, between our uh, stable rank objects uh, just by as the integral of the uh, scalar product between stable ranks between two persistent modules X and Y, between two barcodes uh, X and Y. And um, here uh, the take home message is that we have moved uh, from this space of persistent modules or barcode, which is complicated to a space of functions, uh, which uh, endowed with L2 distance is a Hilbert space. So we can do scalar products and, and we can um, easily define a kernel. This is a simplification process which allows us to do statistics and machine learning on this space of functions. Uh, in particular, we can use a support vector machine or statistical tests on kernels to understand how the stable ranks look like for, for different metrics. Um, last part of the talk is about some experiments which we think are, are very interesting. And uh, the data set is simple and it's um, uh, just samplings from different shapes. So we have circle, rectangle, triangle, and empath. And we sample 100 points from each of these four shapes, 500 times per shape, and uh, resulting in these 1,000 point clouds in two-dimensional space, which are labeled by, by the shape. Here are some examples. Uh, we run our stable rank pipeline, and uh, with H0, we actually don't see much difference between the shapes. And by using the kernel and support vector machine, we can see that we have an accuracy of 35%. So not so good. But if we do H1, so first homology, and already a standard metric, so a standard contour, we obtain 88.5% accuracy in classification with support vector machine. And by uh, finding um, an optimized contour with a cross-validation procedure, we can obtain 94.75% accuracy. So we can improve accuracy in a classification task by providing an appropriate metric. Here are some beta curves that tells us about densities of bars in a barcode decomposition. And we have found them uh, interesting actually to define uh, contours or distances by hand. They, we could use them usually as a, as a guideline. And here is, is the last example. So uh, one problem with uh, topological uh, invariants is that they are usually very, uh, they are, don't work well when you have ambient noise or outliers. So the patterns which are in the data are destroyed when you have a, a sort of outliers. They are stable with respect to small perturbations of your data set or perturbations of your data set in a metric way, but not with respect to outliers. So when we do H1 by adding ambient noise, uh, we see that the stable ranks all look the same. We have lost the signal distinguishing them. But by a subsampling procedure, of subsampling for 20% of the points 50 times and averaging, the signatures become distinct again. So in particular, since we are in this space of functions, we can average and do it many times and uh, build these average descriptors, which are actually very robust to noise. So here we can see that uh, as a function, uh, a function of our accuracy will support vector machine with respect to ambient noise. And we see that also if we have something like 50% ambient noise, we uh, achieve very high accuracy, almost 70% with the subsampling technique. While with the normal descriptor, it would be like 40% accuracy. So we think this is very promising. And also as an approach, it is the idea of subsampling locally many times and averaging rather than having a global descriptor 
of your data set as for example, body numbers or other characteristics. In conclusion, I hope to have convinced you that uh, we can use topology to extract geometrical information from data in the form of a point cloud, a metric space, a graph, a directed graph, and that we can summarize this in a discrete way by counting uh, simply these Betty numbers or using this other characteristic, which was the starting point of this story. Uh, but uh, we can also use other descriptors as for example, persistent homology or stable ranks, which are provably stable with respect to some perturbations in, in your data set. In particular, uh, we like stable ranks because we can build many features from your data set by changing the metric. And uh, we want to further understand their statistical behavior with respect to subsampling and uh, how they can be used uh, in a very good discriminating way in, in machine learning. Thank you for your attention.